Okay. Uh, so, thanks everybody for coming tonight. Um, I'm excited to talk about Jensen's legacy with these my illustrious panel members here who thankfully showed up. Uh, I'm kidding. They were going to come all the time. <laughs> um, no, they're great people and they really know their Jensen stuff. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about Jensen's legacy, what it means, and then we're also going to talk a little bit about um, why it's relevant today. So. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to ask a few questions. We're going to talk about that, and at the end of it, we're going to do a little Q&A. How's that sound? Um, OK, so I want to ask you guys this question I asked before, which was, um, you know, you, you, I'm a filmmaker. I come to Jensen, like, you know, years after anybody would care, right? And, um, but you guys were influenced by him in your own careers. So what was the thing that was the aha moment for each of you on Jensen? I started to have it in this time. <laughs> You're on first this time, buddy. <laughs> well, these two gentlemen are practitioners who have done a great deal of work developing the, the landscape of Lake Forest uh, and nearby. Um, you almost can't turn a corner without uh, running into their work. Um, and, it, and if it looks pretty natural and like it happened by accident, it's what they did. They wanted it to look that way. Um, I came at this from, uh, I come from Michigan, and I had experience in gardening of the more uh, traditional formal kind. And um, it, it, uh, when I came to, to this area, I got to know um, Bruce Johnson, who was um, uh, a member of the community here. Also, uh, it was as an archivist and librarian, I was going to people's houses and removing their books and uh, things when they, in the 80s when houses turned over, the big places. And I gradually got to know the old estates. And so uh, that's how I really came to Jensen and noticing how much of the, he, there are about 40 estates in Lake Forest, Lake Bluff that he actually created that we know about because there are drawings or clear records. And there are, I think, probably more that we don't know about. Um, we have, I know there along the North Shore, there's one estate in Glencoe that um, we just have, um, we have no drawing, we just have material about it. Uh, the, the bills that Mrs. Fulkerson sent to the, to the family and a list of all the plants that were delivered. Um, so it, it varies, but we, we know a lot of his had a big impact on, on Lake Forest. So I'll pass this along. Cliff? I had developed a uh, special relationship with uh, the natural world as a young boy. So when I got into landscaping uh, after teaching environmental education and combining that with my gardening, I was just really into uh, gardening in the naturalistic style. Um, I spent a lot of time in the woods, the prairies, and all those type of environments, sort of uh, Jensen S, but I never met him or heard about him or knew anything uh, about him at all until after several years in the business, I got a call from Highland Park Park District and they said that they needed to rebuild the Jensen Garden, and they thought I was the one to do it. And I asked them what a Jensen Garden was, and they kind of laughed. <laughs> and they said, well, why don't you come here and we'll show you. So when I got there and took a look, I was just, I was just you know, I used to build a lot of terrariums when I was a kid. And, you know, the thing you did was try to condense all of that nature down to these small little spaces. And all of a sudden, I'm looking at, you know, my terrarium on steroids. These drawings have all, I mean, the places and all the rocks and stone. And so it was fascinating for me to, you know, to come to it from that angle to sort of follow the stone. And so very few, if not none, of the plants that were part of Jensen's plans uh, existed at this point, but the rock was everywhere. And if you, you know, you could read the tone, the element, and the expression that Jensen was trying to uh, um, portrayed through the, through the layout of that. So anyway, that's how I came to know Jensen was uh, compliments of Highland Park Park District. And I learned a lot more about him from this man right here. Well, I was another wild boy in the woods, I'd say, when I was young. Whenever I'd hear talk of time to go to church or let's play golf or there's a dance coming up, I'd head for the woods and try to escape. 
if I could. And I'd say it was in my late teens, though, that I discovered Jens Jensen, probably through the book that was written by him, about him, Leonard Eaton's book. It was published in 1963, and uh, it all kind of fell into place for me, the, the concept. What I'd seen out in the woods, I had this feeling that there's something really important here. But when I read what the man had written and talked about, this spiritual sense that's there, that what you're seeing out in the prairies and the woods is a gift being given to you to bring to others. That's really what moved me and motivated me then to go on to be a landscape architect, uh, study that, and, and work on, uh, as you heard in my bio, a lot of things that he'd done, the forest preserves and things like that. Um, including working on several of his properties, as I mentioned this morning, one of my favorites was a large estate in Highland Park, which we really had restored beautifully, and then the owner had to go to jail. So that was the, that was the end to that project. So, and then I came to work in Lake Forest, so another form of jail, some would say. But, Wow. Anyway, it's the connection, that, and that's what this movie brings out. That, that You don't just go out and, and see the, the, these, these landscapes are talking to you. You're, they're telling you something. It's, it's God speaking and calling us, taking what we see, and bring it out and share it with others. That's what really moved me. I have my own. Oh. You can keep that one. Um, you know, I want to say that uh, it took me like a... This film took, well, I think I was a small child when we started it. So back and like trying to figure out what drew me to it, it took me a really long time to figure this out, but um, we had left Chicago uh, during the riots in 68 as a child and ended up in Whitewater Lake. And um, I lived in a house that had flagstone Walls, and I guess it was a student of Frank Lloyd Wright that had been making it, and he was a minister, and it was building as an artist retreat. But the experience that I had of running around the forest and um, skiing and skating and biking and playing hide and seek in the woods and getting lost in the Kettle Moraine State Park. It took me a really long time to realize that that was the thing that drew me to him. But what, what connected me to him was the Chicago upbringing where when we would go back to the city every weekend because my dad still worked in Chicago um, and like how grimy it felt and how unsafe it felt all of a sudden and how different it felt and dark in comparison to being outside. And you know, I, I uniquely had sort of both experiences full on, and I, I never really realized that it was that, that like, sanctity of nature uh, from being a city kid that, you know, like, we experienced anti-Semitism while we were there. Um, you know, we were to some extent outsiders because we were Jewish, and, um, but none of that mattered when you were running around in the forest. Unless, of course, it happened to be hunting season, and then it would <laughs> really don't want to be running around in the woods. But, um, but no, I mean, it, it, it sort of struck me a long time later that, that the, the feeling that he talks about in the end, where he says, I was out of the strife, I was out of the woods, you know, and, and I felt happy. That's how I felt when I came back from the city and was running around the woods. And so I knew that he was really onto something as a guy who was a city guy that, you know, then moved to the burbs, then finally moved way far away. Um, so I think that, you know, I've gone to be thinking about what does it mean to be out in nature? What does that really feel like? And what, it, the, what is the thing that he's trying to insert into a city park that you can experience uh, you know, uh, uh, something like that um, and what that really means. And I think that therein lies the beauty of this and that he emulated these 
incredible prairie spaces where people who were living cheek to jowl and, you know, as you saw in like one thing, there was one bath for every 600 people. I mean, you know, it's couldn't, the city couldn't be worse at that time. So the meaning of the value of nature in the city being this little oasis, literally, um, I, I could understand that because I got that. That was part of my upbringing. And it, it really, really took a long time to finally connect to that. I had thought that we were just making a film about a guy whose story I kind of liked. But I didn't really know why. And I think that that's why this, this story, I mean, we finished the film in the end of 2013. Why it's still playing is because I think people can connect in that way to see that you know, most of the world now lives in a city. Most of the, of the entire world lives in a city and that is the direction we're going. So we have to make our cities livable and the way we make them livable is by installing some space where people can have nature and calm the way that I described it, the way that he described it. Yeah, you know, maybe that's something to do with why you guys got into, you know, working with nature in the first place. Could that be? <laughs> or would somebody push you into you? it? What about you? <laughs> <laughs> I've always been there. Yeah, it's all about it. Yeah. I guess I'm the different one. I wasn't so much in the, in the forest until I began to know Jensen. Through Wait, he needs a mic. Oh, oh yeah, sorry yeah. about oh, that. Sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm a little different than these fellas because I didn't have that same experience in the forest. Um, so that uh, I gradually got to know Jensen. I think I stayed at a, I, as a graduate student at the University of Chicago, I stayed in an estate that he had landscaped, um, but that didn't have a tremendous impact on me. Um, but gradually, uh, up in this area, I ran into it more and more, and as the, um, certainly the landscape at, at the Radio Foundation, um, which was, it, it, I don't think, it isn't attributed to Jensen, but Jensen worked a lot with Shaw, and Shaw did it himself. Howard Van Doren Shaw, the architect, did his own landscape on Green Bay Road. And I don't know if any of you have ever had a, a landscape architect over for lunch or something. They kind of tell you what to do with your yard, whether you want to know or not. <laughs> I know they're boring, but they don't tell you what to do. Well, <laughs> so... Um, you find things out that way from talking to people, and, and certainly the, uh, the Ragdale landscape was certainly a thing that I tried to understand, and so that I could explain it to other people, it was, um, it was valuable. So that's my start there. Next? You have, um, a, place in, you have yeah. a place in Michigan, Michigan. You get I have my own clearing. That's right. But there's no school. <laughs> <laughs> there's no, good, good. You don't have to go raise money for it. Um, what's that? Yeah. Next question. Um, okay, so what makes Jensen important today to you guys? Why should we care about Jensen right now? I think I already said that. It's, it's, uh, it's the spiritual side of what he, he uh, brought forth. Uh, time is different today. Our cities are different. Our society <clears throat> is different. You look at those pictures that people actually went to a play out in a dune and sat all day in the sun and watched something. Whereas now, what do we do? We guess we just pull this out, right? That's all we need. So it's important, I think, to peel back the layers, I feel, from his era, his positions and stances on um, things, and, and really see that he's talking about something that's uh, eternal in all of us, which is the spiritual connection with creation and how creation has been formed for us to share with others, to interpret and share and give back. That's my view. <laughs> um, well, I think that, to give it a little different take on that, I think that the, the fact that um, so much of the um, landscape has been urbanized or farmed and things like that, and we're starting to go in the other direction to bring things back, to bring uh, more balance into the uh, atmosphere of uh, having things clean the air in the cities and in the uh, with with green roofs and uh, green walls and that sort of thing that um, Jensen would have approved entirely I think of us trying to feed our uh, ecosystem with with uh, natural taking natural nature wherever we can take it 
and that's been, a, I think, a big, a big difference too that's uh, made it more important now. <clears throat> I think that uh, for myself, what the benefit of Jensen today is, you know, the legacy of not only what he did from a landscape point of view, but his vision and his helping and connecting people to the very thing that, uh, you know, so much of us reach for today, the natural world and bringing that into the cities and sort of the equality of the council ring and all these social sides to him that were really, really very powerful drivers of what affects us really every day. Every day I drive by a forest reserve or a saved piece of land or something like that. And you know, it was those efforts with the dunes, Papoon's effort with uh, Illinois Beach and all of these people back at the turn of the century, 20s, who put together a legacy of you know, what we enjoy today. And uh, so when I see that or when I think about that, I mean, it's part of who we are. It's the legacies, it's part of the North Shore. His impact is all throughout. And his whole uh, understanding and ability to bring people to the landscape and obviously the landscape to the people was really remarkable. And uh, to this day, I think, and Stephen, who's worked on a lot of parks, and myself who worked with him, you know, one of the main things that we try to do is connect people to that land. And uh, he was a master, and I think we all benefit from that today. Yeah. Um, you can keep that. <laughs> uh, the, um, I, think, I think that his ideas, um, are more important than ever, actually, because it's very easy because of the phone and mobile communications and stuff to ignore going outside because there's that distraction that exists everywhere. Uh, and you know, it's it's now like most of the globe, people are distracted and they're not going outside, and we're losing a generation of people that value going outside. Well. So then where are they going to go to calm down? And you know, since, since that time, I've kind of looked at neurological studies that are being done about the brain's connection to nature, and, um, Japanese, and which, are, which show that uh, there's a guy at U University of Champaign who has been studying that and showing that our brains like literally navigate toward greenery and against and away from concrete. So it's like it fires up a lot of cylinders when, the green, when it sees the greenery. To Japanese forest bathing, which is uh, you know, a Japanese method of calming down, which is literally just walking in the woods. Like no drugs, nothing. You just walk in the woods, walk out of the woods. That's it. And it, it dramatically reduces your anxiety because it brings you back to being aware of your surroundings, being aware of something outside of yourself. I mean, we all live in a construct that is our lives, and nature is a completely different construct that has nothing to do with you that you have to pay attention to if you're in, because you otherwise walk into a tree or get eaten by a bear, who knows what. Um, so I think that it's now that we have these, these cities that were planned so many decades ago that they lack park space in a lot of the areas that are that are becoming very heavily congested now, now there's a reason to have to go and figure out how can we put nature back into those places? And what is the value of doing that? You know, um, and why is it important to allow people to have access to nature? You have to make that case. Um, uh, I'll digress a little bit. I, I, it, the film caused me to want to find out um, what's going on in the neighborhoods that Jensen was in that, um, like what, what's happened in the last 100 years. And so I went and I met with an organization called Neighbor Space, who's part of Trust for Public Lands. And they were putting in uh, play spaces, naturalistic play spaces, which they put one at the Garfield Park Conservatory. And they wanted to do another one in Little Village. And so I wanted to help them out. And I got the Student Conservation Association to build this park for these kids. And the reason why I was so interested in it is because when I found out that to get from 
26 in Loomis, I think is the address, um, to, Doug, to Douglas Park, which is the closest Jensen Park and almost like, I don't know, seven blocks away or something, you would have to cross eight gang lines to get to this park. And realizing that this magnificent park exists, but it's not, in fact, accessible. And so the modern version of why we need parks, and we need more parks, and we need more of them, even small ones that are nature respite spa spaces, is what he was tapped into at that point. Uh, I mean, his communities that were planned with uh, nature areas and community gardens and stuff speaks to that. Um, and creating these like strong, close-knit communities that are very hard to find now. But think about, like, that is actually direction that urban planners are moving in, that exact direction. And, you know, I felt like I learned a lot when I found out about this little garden and I, and I helped set up the SCA to work on it over the summer. And to that end, I started making a short film uh, about it, about, like, what's the meaning of this park to the mothers in the neighborhood? Now, most of the block that the park is on is a gang hangout. The other side of the street, the where the park is built, which is just a 25 by 125 scrappy lot that was there, now they move to the other end, which is a abandoned firehouse. Um, but it's like a spectacular gem of a space. There's no plastic in it. It's all built out of recycled trees, donated stuff, uh, and the community planned it. So they had a bunch of design charrettes where they brought in the community through Our Lady of Tepeyac School and Head Start and Catholic Charities and all the groups that were in the neighborhood to try to get them to want to be part of this and to show them that they had a hand in the access to this park. So I wanted to show you a little clip of a mother um, that from the Heart and Cito, this was at the end of the day, I'd interviewed about 30 or 40 people and I met this woman. So you see the, the video is pretty intense on the color because it's like super end of day light, but it's a pretty intense minute and a half interview, which pretty much tells you the whole story, why it's important. Okay, do you want to roll that? Thanks. I've never felt so comfortable in a in a place like this, how this little jardincito is, you see how these are all standing here and um, having the children around? It, it's like a, you feel like it's your safe place. Because if you see them trying to play in the, on their bikes out here, they're like kind of free. You know, right now we could be talking and some crazy guy could just come out of nowhere. It's been too, too much out here right now. And there's programs that there is, but there's, they're always far away. And nobody ever shown the textbook people. I'm not anything, but people judge people sometimes and they don't even bother to take the time to even try to meet them and understand them. And the children can't be children. And that's, that's a crime shame that they can't be themselves. You know how many of these children have seen their uncles, their brothers, their mothers, if it's abuse or if it's just people getting hurt outside, they've seen it all. There has never been nothing like this. And it's really beautiful. Maybe maybe the new generation is going to be a better generation. And they're going to teach their children to become better people. This is the best thing that ever happened. It's very, very, very very best thing I've ever seen in my whole life so far. So that's what a park means. I mean, you know, you've got a neighborhood that is so broken and uh, it just warmed my heart to meet somebody like that that really was like, I, I would think about like, oh, up on the north side in Roscoe Village where I was living then, if you told the mothers there'd be like another park, they'd go like, yeah, great, I'll send my nanny with the kids over there, you know? And in this case, it's, it's like, you know, it's like a clinging to a life, a life raft. 
Uh, and I think that she, you know, pretty much said it from the heart that it's the greatest thing that ever happened to her here. You know, I mean, if you can bring that kind of statement out of somebody uh, with a little park that was that took a summer to build, um, you know, what does that tell you? So should we take some questions now, though? Do you think from the audience? Yeah. Should we? Yep. Yes. I think it'd be great. Okay, let's take some questions from the audience. Just wanted to make sure you guys saw a little bit of that. Thank you. Yeah. You can hold that now. <laughs> <laughs> questions? Yeah, back there. Lady back here. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, and Carrie, I've seen this movie several times. I love it. Um, my question to you would be, is that if you were going to make suggestions on a children's book... Just wants to chime in. What role will virtual reality have in bringing parks and all the emotions that you describe to more people? Thanks, John. <laughs> What's virtual reality? <laughs> I actually would think, or I feel, that the phone in his pocket, the virtual reality, and all of these things take people farther away, not closer to. So I guess while virtual reality is a very interesting interaction and it's cool and it's all that, it's just another layer between that child and that tree. And... Uh, I think we're all a little healthier when we peel away those layers. And so, as much fun as that is, to me it's a video game, and the real thing is outside our doors. I would just say that one of the things about um, a natural setting is the presence of all the different senses that you have. You see, you hear, you um, smell. Uh, you can almost taste some things that are in, the, in nature. Um, so that I think that, uh, and, and you'll certainly touch them. So I think that, I'm not sure how you can get that electronically. I think that that's one of the reasons that people, why they're urging people to go into these spaces is because you, you communicate, you walk through it, it's a moving thing, um, and it's constantly changing for you, and all these different senses are, are employed at once. Are you going to say some more here for a change? Um, I just want to throw in a word. John, that's a good point. Uh, virtual reality, the, the pitch I want to make to all of you, because I was asked tonight, what do you think is Jensen's best work? And I'm going to throw out to you the Garfield Park Conservancy, the one room that's in there that we saw in the film. That's probably as close as a virtual reality experience as you could have in the landscape, because it's, it's contained. I guess it's like when you have those goggles on, it's contained. And yet it's taking you back 150 million years, as the fellow said there. Jensen had the uh, artistic ability to bring to life something that none of us have ever seen. It's, it's just a wonderful room. So I want to put that question out. If you go, go to Garfield Park and go to the central room when you walk in the door, it's depressed, actually, the way Jensen designed it. So as you walk up to it, you're looking down in the, into this Silurian, Jurassic type of landscape. It's, and it's completely unchanged from when it was built. That's the other thing we were talking about. Landscape, it's hopeless. You, you make them, Cliff, you've done that. They're not maintained. Stuff grows, it dies, it's forgotten about. This room that was made in 1907 is exactly in the same shape it was then. So to me, that's a good start for virtual reality. And I'd also say, thinking about it, I might disagree with these two. Maybe virtual reality is a start to getting kids outside. Like, let's watch the cartoon first, and then we'll watch the movie, and then we'll see the real thing. Got a point there. I still don't know what it is. <laughs> but you can talk about it. <laughs> I have a question for the youngest architect up there. <laughs> That's you. As a homeowner that possibly, that I believe we have a Yen Jensen landscape, how aggressive should we be to maintain, to maintain it? 
Well, well you know, that's a pretty broad question. Uh, maintain, reestablish, there's lots of different ways to define maintenance. As, as Steve alluded to, one of the problems with the Jensen Gardens and that whole style uh, is, you know, at that time in our history, vegetatively, everything was highly dynamic and changing. Farms were taking out the, the woods, there was no more fire, cattle went all through these areas. Everything was changing, it was highly dynamic, not only for us as people, but for the plants as well. And so during that period when prairies were becoming brush and woods were becoming denser, you know, that's when Jensen was practicing. It was 60 years, 70 years after people had first come here and the manipulation was immediate. So my point is only that the plants that he saw and the plants that he loved were not the plants that had been there before or there today. So it's that dynamic, that change that makes it so difficult for us to know what was planted in these gardens. And at that point in time, the landscape plans were far more general. Uh, roses and bushes, flowering trees, you know, things like that. And they were huge masses, not individual plants. So when you talk about, you know, how to maintain, I would move more toward the emotional side of it, you know, and look at what were Jensen's, you know, he had so many techniques, the sunroom, things like this, that he used to control or to push you in directions that most people don't even realize is happening. Uh, and I would try to find out what was the message your garden, um, he brought with your garden, and I would work towards trying to do that. But uh, so maintain, it's a historical relic. Uh, you know, my feeling is we have responsibilities to protect those, enhance them, uh, or at least restore them. And so I'm glad to hear that question. Um, but there's a lot of different ways you can go about it. I'm the oldest, can I? I'm the oldest so I just have a comment too. Um, but speaking about the sort of garden historical thing, there is always debate about how accurate you can do something. Uh, the accuracy mostly works for the very few most famous places. Uh, that works best. But I think often garden historians in England and here will say that um, maybe your best solution is to, to find, if you have a little bit of money, pay a really good designer to look at your place and see how it speaks to that person and to come up with something for you today in that same spirit, which is, he said. But um, I think that the design is critical and that not the specifics, um, but the whole. Uh, so it's more of a right brain thing than a left brain thing. Thank you. Um, I just need to embellish a little bit on this young lady's uh, comments earlier. It happens to be my, my wife. We live in a... Uh, uh, development called the Ponds, which is right in Lake Forest, bordering on 41 and Wesley Road. And it was the Swift Estate, old Swift Estate. And Kendler bought it and developed it, but developed it for one particular reason, that there would be 156 acres of land and 156 half acres of homes, half acre lots. The rest is the ponds. There's three natural ponds and uh, meadows and natural, completely natural, untouched, and mm. prairie grass and so forth. And on one other border, there's the uh, Chicago North Branch of the Chicago River, which they call the Skokie River or whatever. Um, they, um, we're trying to keep this very natural, and there's no real reason to disturb it but the county, Lake County, is coming through and bordering all of the edges of the river with stone and wire and things like that. Uh, and we just are beside ourselves. We don't know what to do. You drive through the neighborhood, it looks like a regular neighborhood, but it's behind the houses that is just fabulous. Even the berms aren't mowed, so it's pristine. You're not even supposed to own a cat to protect the birds. So. Mm. Uh, if you had any advice for how we approach that. Could you just repeat the, the, your final question? Do we have any I, advice? I, I, for the, what? This was the Swift Estate. That was all right. designed by Yen Jensen. Yeah. And the 
all the property along there is all design, has never been touched. And that is the common property of how it should be maintained is the final question. So uh, that's what we're okay. concerned about is, is should it ever be burned down? They're doing common property burning of those original plans. And well, it's about, and it's usually about 20 acres along there. So it's the first time it'll ever be touched since the original Jan Jensen touch. So that's what we're wondering is how aggressive an owner should be of maintaining something like that. Th that was the question really. He got a little more into it. Thank you. Well, Sorry. you know, in actuality, that whole thing was bulldozed and completely manipulated and entirely man-made. The ponds, the, the yeah. berm, and all of that stuff. Not the riverside. The river was ditched. The river was ditched. It wasn't a river. It wasn't a river at all. As a matter of fact, the ponds are built on what was the original riverbed. And that was a whole series of swamps and undevelopable and was kept for a farm for, you know, almost a century. Um, but so, so, so when they ditched it and created the Skokie Ditch, as a lot of people call it, I like the East Branch of the Chicago River and all that sort of stuff. But, but the bottom line is, is that piece of property has been highly manipulated. And I don't mean that negatively. I mean it from the point that I love to hear that from your side where the feel is that it hasn't been manipulated, the appreciation that you have. Uh, these are things that were developed by the architects who did that plan. I watched that whole thing you know, being built and I remember Kendler <laughs> reaching out for the naturalists in the area to design the berms and make recommendation for plants and they planted the pines and the aspen and the hawthorn. So all of that went through this high manipulation and of course the ponds were built as retention as part of the requirements for the wetland disturbances. So I love to hear the fact that it looks entirely natural and you wouldn't even think it, but for the most part it's highly manipulated. Okay, I want to thank our panel for being here tonight. Thank you all for coming.